Hi guys, and welcome back to part three of the four-part mucus series. If you are just tuning in and you're wondering, lady, why should I care about mucus? This is weird. Go ahead and check out parts one and two of the series where I talk about the role of the intestinal mucus layer, why it matters, and the things that will promote its healing or health. But the big thing is, if you want to avoid leaky gut syndrome, and if you want to keep your intestinal microbes happy, then the mucus is pretty gosh darn important. So in today's video, we're going to talk about the things that can degrade the mucus, make it thinner, or make it lesser quality. And therefore, these are things that you can try to avoid if you want a happy, healthy, thick mucus layer and happy, healthy microbes. Let's get right into it. So the first angle we can look at this is looking at a lack of things that help promote the health of the mucus layer. So truthfully, you could go back and watch my other video about this, where I talk about the things that will encourage the growth and the health of the mucus layer, but I've broken it down here as well. So a lack of vitamins, particularly vitamin A and vitamin D, those are going to help regulate the signaling between you and your mucous membrane and your microbes. So vitamin D and vitamin A are incredibly important for maintaining the health of the microbiota and the mucous membrane. So a lack of those nutrients is going to affect your mucus lining adversely. Likewise, butyrate or short chain fatty acids in general. So there's others, acetate and propionate, but a lack of short chain fatty acids like butyrate is also going to degrade the mucus lining or make it poorer quality. How do you get butyrate, you might be saying? Well, you could take it as a supplement, true, but ultimately that production is going to come from the diversity of your fiber sources and your complex carbohydrates and your nutrition, and then the things that you eat that you're not able to break down, being your fiber and your prebiotics, those things are going to help the microbes make short chain fatty acids like butyrate, and then the butyrate in turn is going to signal the health of the the mucus lining and it's going to signal those goblet cells to make more mucus. So butyrate, yes, you can take it as a supplement or as an enema, but I really think that this drives home the point of nutrition, but we'll get to that in a minute. Likewise, good microbes. There's been a lot of studies of looking at different probiotic species or strains and increasing the thickness or the quality of the mucus lining. So just good microbes overall, but certainly the abundance of the research we have has been done on lactobacilli, Bifidobacterium and Acromancia up until this point. So good bacteria just broadly are going to promote the, the good health of the mucus. I talked about this in the video about the things that promote the health of the mucus lining, but you need proper motility and proper gut brain axis function in order to physically sweep out the old mucus and then stimulate the formation of the new mucus. So you could argue that vagus nerve function gut brain axis function, maybe even proper adrenal function and stress regulation are all going to play a role in how the gut functions and how the mucus lining is protected and kept healthy. Likewise, you can imagine, you know, the picture that I've drawn here, the purple cells are the cells of your intestinal lining. So in this case, I drew it as part of the colon. And then the colon has two layers of mucus. It has a very thick, tightly adhered layer of the mucus lining and a very loose loose layer of mucus, and that's constantly being turned over. The loose mucus lining is where some of the microbes live, and the dense mu mucus is said to be relatively impenetrable to bacteria and critters. So you've got two layers of the colon, and then look what we have here. The, the, blah, blah, blah. the vast majority of your immune system cells live just below the gut lining. That's why things like leaky gut and dysbiosis are such a big deal for people with autoimmune disease and even cancer and things like autism. These inflammatory conditions are provoked because the immune system sees or senses that things are getting weird and it's trying to mount a response or mount an attack to protect you. But proper immune signaling also influences the thickness and the quality of the mucus. I'll link it, there was a cool study, I'll link it in the description for today for those of you who want to get really dirty but they actually had a nice diagram where they talked about different inflammatory cytokines or immune regulatory cytokines and how that affects these gene transcription factors and ultimately affects the mucus lining. So broadly, I will just say that proper immune function and signaling is probably involved in the regulation of the mucus membrane. So if you are a person who has overt autoimmunity, or if you're in a flare, or if you have Crohn's or colitis and you're in the middle of a big flare, or if you have an untreated infection, 
those are the sorts of things that are going to make the immune system quite dysregulated and then that could affect the health of your mucus in an adverse way. So sometimes, and I've been saying this for years now, oftentimes people, especially in my profession, will say, oh, if you treat the gut, then the immune system will be good. So they treat it as a one-way street. And that does have some merit to it, like that oftentimes does pan out. But there's also something to be said for trying to directly affect the immune system in hopes that it will affect the gut and heal the gut. And I do find that that is an angle that very few people are taking in the IBS and SIBO and IBD world and the autoimmune world. Everybody wants to look at gut to immune system, but very few people are looking from an immune gut direction. Again, it's a two-way street. So I'll just say that proper immune functioning or signaling is playing a role in the mucus quality. And then finally, as I mentioned before, nutrition is huge. Not only your vitamins and minerals, but also the thing that's going to foster the diversity of your microbiome and the diverse signaling that the goblet cells need to make this mucus for you, that is going to be mostly affected by your nutrition, particularly the variety and diversity of your plant foods, the fiber, the carbohydrates, and then to some extent also protein because you do need some protein to make the mucus and like actually stick the mucus particles together. So protein, carbs, fiber, and diversity and nutritional elements like vitamins and minerals are probably the biggest things that are going to affect the mucus. Dietary fat is important for other things, but it's probably a little bit less directly involved with the mucus lining. So do make sure that you're getting enough of these things if you want a happy, healthy mucus lining and ultimately, like I said, a non-leaky, non-inflamed gut. And finally, the presence of some quote unquote bad things could also degrade the mucus lining or affect its quality. Now I'm gonna do something a little atypical and I'm gonna hold this in my hand and read from it just a teeny bit because A, yes, I still print out research articles and highlight them with an actual highlighter, but B, there was just some nuances that I don't have memorized, frankly, so I'm just gonna read you a little bit. But the gist of it being that the presence of probably dysbiosis or a lack of microbiota diversity is going to be one of the big things that affects this, right? Because again, it's the bacteria sending signals to the goblet cells and to the surrounding cells that ultimately prompt the goblet cells to make mucus. So a lack of diversity or a lack of good bacteria or too many bad bacteria will certainly affect that. Now, one thing that I thought was interesting is that in populations where there's a high amount of disulfovibrio, that is a hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria, they noted that the mucus quality was poor and it was said to be loose or less attached. So again, if you think about, you have this dense layer of mucus that tightly adheres to the cells of the colon and is supposed to be impenetrable to bacteria or relatively so. And then you have this loose bacteria where some of the microbes can pop populate that. Then desulfovibrio seems to influence that so you get more of this loosey-goosey stuff and maybe not as much of the nice, dense, protective mucus. So the sulfa vibrio piger specifically has been associated with that. And I forget if it was an animal study, I think it was a mouse study, but I thought that was interesting since I see a lot of overgrowth of the sulfa vibrio amongst my patients with IBS and SIBO and IBD. So that's something I've observed for a number of years in stool testing. Now infections just across the board are going to, again, provide different signaling to the, the colon cells and the goblet cells and then affect the mucus quality. And they could thin it, pardon me, thin it directly. So one of those being Giardia. Giardia infection, so that's a parasitic infection, will affect the mucus quality in a negative or detrimental way. Similarly with Vibrio, Vibrio cholera. So any sort of overt infection or overgrowth can do this as well. Uh, H. pylori is also going to affect the mucus lining, certainly in the stomach itself. I don't know if H. pylori overgrowth in the stomach is going to affect the colon mucus, but certainly H. pylori infection is going to affect the mucus in the stomach itself. So those are a couple of big infections to consider. And that this is where I don't have this really memorized, but I'll just share with you. This study uh, titled Mucus, an Underestimated Gut Target for Environmental Pollutants and Food Additives was really, really fascinating. Now, a lot of this is not going to be directly studied in humans. A lot of these are in vitro studies where they're basically growing 
colon cells or epithelial cells and they're growing a mucus layer and then they're introducing things in the petri dish, not in a living thing. But I thought it was still really interesting. So in this study, they specifically mention arsenic, cadmium, and lead. Now, of course, we know that those are all bad for us for a number of different reasons. Among them is that certainly all three of those are very pro-carcinogenic, especially cadmium and arsenic, but also it appears that all three of those, and to some extent maybe mercury, are going to negatively affect the gut mucus layer. So for example, in the study they mentioned that uh, arsenic specifically reduced the abundance of, um, let's see, Sorry, I thought I had it highlighted for you. Okay, maybe I shouldn't read from this. Maybe this is gonna be really boring. So let's, JK, LOL, just pretend um, that I didn't even try and just take my word for it. If you wanna read it, I will link this in the description for today. But arsenic, cadmium, and lead, uh, that was just, that was too awkward and cumbersome. Pesticides, now this shouldn't surprise us because pesticides are going to kill stuff and amongst the stuff they might kill, they might kill good microbes. I've seen some studies specifically with glyphosate where they document that glyphosate kills bifidobacterium and lactobacillus so that it really shouldn't be a surprise that pesticides make the list. Uh, also, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Now, this is going to be very broad and encompass many different things. You can certainly type this into a Google search and find out what I mean by this. But things like phthalates, parabens, PCBs, PFOS and PFOA, like non-stick things like Teflon, uh, bisphenols, this runs the gamut. In this particular study, the one that stood out to me that they mentioned was PFOS. So these are things like PFOA and PFOS compounds are things like Scotchgard and Teflon. They are non-stick things that we use to coat or protect surfaces that we don't want to harm. So things like Scotch Guard, Teflon, that those would be the most used. But these chemicals, certainly if they're ingested, so thinking more maybe about Teflon than anything else, those things also can disrupt the mucus layer at least to some extent. Now again, these are typically Petri dish studies. They're not like studying this in a human model, but it does kind of beg the question if we should be avoiding a lot of these compounds to the best of our ability. I would argue yes. And this is where like the holistic shtick kind of comes in, right? If you just focus on the microbes and you don't zoom out and think about things like detoxification and adrenals and brain health and blood sugar, then you're probably missing the boat on a lot of your healing. So endocrine disruptors, I'm just gonna put that broadly. But again, in this article, they mentioned the nonstick things like Teflon. And that also I put a question mark here for food additives. Now again, these are petri dish studies. They are in vitro, they're not in vivo. But among them, this is where I will, I'll just reference really quickly to tell you what's in here. Among them, they mention nanoparticles. So things like titanium dioxide, silicone dioxide, nanoparticles of silver, and then they mentioned food additives like emulsifiers and carrageenan. So in an overzealous amount, or if these are overrepresented in your diet because you're eating a lot of processed food, then that could certainly trigger an inflammatory response or the degradation of the mucus layer. And what's interesting is that they do use carrageenan to induce colitis in animal models sometimes. So it makes you wonder if you're eating too many of these emulsifiers and these food additives, maybe that's degrading the mucus quality. I mean, I think that it stands to reason that any of these things, either because they're inflammatory and that's going to affect immune signaling and the gut-brain axis, or things that are going to potentially kill microbes like uh, pesticides, or even they mentioned silver nanoparticles as being antimicrobial to a point where it's killing good microbes. These are all things that can negatively affect your mucus layer. So eliminating the things on this list to the best of your ability and trying to replenish the things on this list are going to be really helpful for reestablishing a healthy mucus layer and again, healing your gut and making sure that your gut is not inflamed and leaky. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.